Okay, let's resume, ladies and gentlemen. Excellencies, we will now begin our interactive dialogue with a special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Javaid Rehman, special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Before I give the floor to the special rapporteur, I would like to remind you that the list of speakers will close in 15 minutes. I now invite Mr. Rehman to present his report. You have the floor. Madam Vice President, distinguished delegates, participants, I'm honored to address the Human Rights Council to present my report on the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Today, the people of Iran face a myriad of challenges. Many have voiced their concern through protests, demonstrations, and strikes. Many of their concerns relate to rising inflation, working conditions, late or unpaid wages, living standards, and access to work, food, health care, and water. People from diverse sections of society, from truck drivers to teachers to factory workers across the country have protested. The reimposition of secondary sanctions by the United States of America has further increased such concerns and is likely to significantly impact economic and social rights in particular the right to health. It is in this context of increased challenges that concerns are mounting about human rights, including the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and to association in Iran. Worrying patterns of intimidation, arrest, prosecution, and ill treatment of human rights defenders, lawyers, and labor rights activists signal an increasingly severe state response. Last week, the prominent uh, women human rights lawyer, Nasreen Satode, was reportedly convicted of charges relating to her work and could face a lengthy prison sentence. The situation of arrested protesting workers of the Haft Tape sugar mill illustrates the, the breadth of concern. Labor rights defender Ismail Bakshi and journalist Sapide Golian were amongst those who were detained amidst alarm expressed about their ill-treatment in detention. I urge the government to, to release all those detained for exercising their rights to freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, and association. Madam Vice President, the evolving situation also reflects positive developments. In late 2017, an amendment to the drug trafficking law amended punishments for certain drug offenses from the death penalty to a maximum term of 30 years. The change led to a significant reduction in the number of prison persons executed in 2018, and numerous individuals on death row have had their sentences reportedly commuted. Another welcome development is the adoption by the Parliament of a bill allowing children of Iranian mothers and foreign fathers to apply for Iranian citizenship when they reach 18 years old. Notwithstanding these steps, long-standing concerns persist. Concerns, for example, related to freedom of opinion and expression have been illustrated by the arrests of journalists inside the country and the targeting of others outside. The ongoing arrests of lawyers and advocates are worrying given concerns related to the right to a fair trial. If individuals are accused of offenses punishable by death or life imprisonment, or accused of political or press crimes, their choice of legal representation is limited during the investigative stage to lawyers on a list approved by the head of the judiciary. This is disturbing given reports of ill treatment to compel confessions during the investigative stage. Violations of the right to a fair trial underpin concerns articulated by members of many groups. The Working Group on Arbitrary Detention identified a pattern involving the arbitrary deprivation of liberty of dual and foreign nationals in the country. Discrimination of ethnic and religious minority groups, including the Baha'i, Azerbaijani Turkish, Kurdish and Baloch communities is reflected by the disproportionate number of arrests and convictions of members of such groups. Madam Vice President, three days ago, 
the world celebrated International Women's Day. Such celebrations also brought to mind the situation of women's rights advocates in Iran, including those who protested against the compulsory veil. A number of the women have been arrested and sentenced to imprisonment, sometimes suspended. Some individuals who publicly supported their efforts have been imprisoned, such as Farhad Mesami, whose health situation remains worrying. The health situation of a number of other imprisoned individuals identified in my report amidst reports of insufficient access to medical care, such as human rights defender Eraj Sadigi, is also of alarm. I have further received numerous uh, reports about the denial of access to medical care and poor conditions in certain prisons, including Gohardasht Prison, Greater Tehran Central Prison, and Shahriyare Rea Women's Prison. More broadly, I am increasingly concerned about the enjoyment of the right to health in Iran as a result of the imposition of secondary sanctions in November 2018 and restrictions placed on financial transactions which have impacted the availability and cost of medicines, medical services, supplies and equipment. I call upon all states to take all possible steps to ensure that humanitarian and procedural safeguards and exemptions prevent a harmful impact on the enjoyment of human rights in Iran in policy and practice. Madam Vice President, distinguished delegates, I have raised numerous concerns in my report, all deserving of attention. However, there is one critical issue addressed in, my detail, in, my, in, in, in detail in my report that I would highlight today. Iranian law today allows girls as young as nine years and boys as young as 15 years to be sentenced to, to death for certain crimes. As a result, Individuals aged below the age of 18 years, when they allegedly commit certain crimes, have been executed in breach of the obligations that Iran itself committed to through ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Before elaborating, I would note that some children convicted of Kisas crimes, such as intentional murder, have avoided the death penalty because of the government's support for mediation efforts to obtain forgiveness from the families of the murder victims. Other child offenders have avoided the death penalty because of the enactment of Article 91 of the Penal Code in 2013. This article allows judges to pronounce alternative sentences for child offenders if there, are, there was any uncertainty about their mental development at the time of the crime or if, they had realized, or if they have not realized the nature of the crime committed. Notwithstanding such efforts, and despite this article, at least 21 children have been sentenced to death, and at least 33 children had been executed since the enactment of Article 91 in 2013. According to information received, at least 85 child offenders currently languish on death row and six child offenders were executed last year. In my view, such numbers convey a clear message. The content of Article 91 of the Penal Code is not sufficient, and its implementation has not been fully effective. The sentencing of children to death gives further cause for alarm, given the documented pattern of violations related to the lack of access to a lawyer and the reliance on confessions obtained through alleged coercion or ill-treatment during the initial stages of judicial proceedings, in many cases reviewed. The treatment of child offenders on death row is no less alarming. The practice illustrated in many cases reviewed of waiting until the child offender reaches the age of 18 before execution, repeated postponements, and the inherent vulnerability of the child given his or her age amounts to a pattern of torture and other ill treatment. Information reviewed also indicates that many children sentenced to death have lower levels of economic and social standing, education and support networks, and in some cases have faced extreme situations, including forced marriage and alleged domestic violence. However, the Iranian law does not allow the court to take into account these mitigating factors. Madam Vice President, in raising this issue, I follow in the footsteps of every relevant international human rights mechanism 
as well as numerous states during the previous Universal Periodic Reviews. I also follow the debate within the country on this issue, within the administration, the legislature, and within civil society in Iran. And I am aware that the government has already demonstrated its intention to further consider this issue. Accordingly, I reiterate the appeal to the government to abolish the ongoing execution of child offenders and to commute the death sentences of all child offenders on death row. Pending the urgently needed implementation of such measures, I hope the detailed and targeted recommendations in my report will be considered in the spirit of constructive engagement that they are made. Um, Madam Vice President, before I conclude, I pay tribute to the victims of alleged violations, relatives, human rights defenders, lawyers, and representatives of civil society organizations who have engaged with my mandate. I also express my appreciation for all the information submitted to my mandate which I have reviewed, along with government statements, reports and comments, legislation and relevant reports of international human rights mechanisms. In the course of my mandate, I have sought to reach out to the government to seek its cooperation and to reiterate my request for an invitation to visit Iran. I value the meetings held with the government representatives, including a substantive meeting with a high-level delegation last week. The government also provided comments on the report before you and has submitted replies to a number of communications sent in 2018, including four received after finalization of my report. Such engagement generates further hope for further engagement. I will conclude with a respectful invitation of my own to the government that we engage together on the substance and content of my report and issues of concern in line with a collective commitment to work towards the improvement of the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. I thank you. I thank the Special Rapporteur. And as it is the practice in our discussions, we shall start by hearing the delegation of the country concerned. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. You have five minutes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I would like to state the following on this item. First, the Islamic Republic of Iran rejects country-specific resolutions as antithetical to the cause of human rights and counterproductive for its promotion. It only contributes to scapegoating the targeted country at the price of sidelining meaningful interaction and dialogue on human rights. Second, the appointment of a special rapporteur for Iran is an unjust and politically motivated scheme initiated by certain governments in pursuance of their adversarial attitude against our nation. As such, the resolution and its ensuing mandate have only contributed to accumulation of disparaging cliches and malign stereotypes against Iran. 3. Protection and promotion of human rights was one of the fundamental tenets of the Islamic Revolution against the suppressive dictatorship and the Islamic Republic of Iran as the true expression of the nation's long quest for freedom of independence regards human rights as a sublime achievement of the people and it spares no effort in its protection and promotion. We consider the protection and promotion of human rights as a moral and religious obligation, as well as a highly considered necessity for a governing system whose only source of survival and resilience is its people. Iran is determined to continue safeguarding its people against the threat of violent extremism and terrorism, rampant in our region, principally due to addictive interventions, occupation and aggression by the US and its clients. Five, it is a bitter irony, if not hypocritical, to pretend to care for the human rights of the Iranians and feel relaxed and remain acquiescent vis-a-vis -vis unlawful cruel U.S. sanctions which are purposely attuned to take the heaviest toll on children, men and women in need of medicine and medical care as well as refugees our people have been hosting for more than four decades with open eyes. Protection and promotion of human rights is a common cause. However, the abuse of the human rights mechanisms to selectively harass countries enjoying constant progress in the field of human rights compromises the sense of solidarity and it strips this lofty cause of its humane meaning. While we have every reason to genuinely suspect the existence of any good faith 
in appointing a special rapporteur for Iran's human rights, we would not be distracted from serving our people by further deepening our truly indigenous and homegrown democratic system of governance and by institutionalizing our accomplishments in terms of protection and promotion of human rights of our citizens. The Islamic Republic of Iran will continue its genuine interaction with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and other competent UN human rights mechanisms, as well as with other states to collaborate for the protection and promotion of human rights. Minister Zarif has invited Madam High Commissioner to visit the country. Just last week, the Deputy, Deputy High Commissioner and her team visited Iran on a technical mission. Madam Vice President, we even did not shy away from talking frankly to the Special Rapporteur himself about the structural deficiencies and misleading contents of his report. Last Friday, an official delegation from the High Council for Human Rights sat with him here in Geneva for three hours to enlighten him about our progressive human rights performance. We also shared with him some methodological deficits which are inconsistent with Resolution 5-2 on Code of Conduct for Special Procedure Mandate Holders of the Human Rights Council as well as false allegations, absurd disinformation and hyperbolic exaggerations imported to his report. We regret that one of the main sources of the Special Rapporteur continue to be the same terrorist groups which have long been laundered by their supporters and portrayed as opposition and human rights defenders. Madam Vice President, we clarified to him, for instance, that execution of children aged 9 and 15, as he claims in, in his reports, is simply far from true, as it has never happened. Capital punishment is only for the most serious crimes and is imposed through very highly considered due process in accordance with laws. We invited him not to discredit our judicial system if he truly believes in the rule of law fair trial and due process. We clarify to him that titles such as human rights defenders or double nationality cannot bring impunity for the alleged offenders. I thank you, Madam Vice President. I thank you.